We are now continuing with some practical demonstrations, and at first, how to measure as parameters with a vector network analyzer. Doing measurements with my VNWA is in general terms identical to performing measurements with any other brand of VNA. Measurement demonstrated here is from a presentation point of view identical to measurement and VNA from Agilent, Rode and Schwartz, or any other manufacturer. There is no difference. My equipment has one output, the TX port, and one input, the RX port. Many are not aware of that inside the equipment, before the TX output connector, there is a bridge circuit. Utilizing the output signal on the TX port, this bridge circuit is able to measure the reflected wave, thus S11 derived internally, and there is no need for an external bridge. S11 is simply measured by connection the test object to the TX port, and measure S11 of the unknown impedance. If you want to know how much is passing through a filter, then you connect one end of the filter to the TX port, and the other end to the RX port, and then you are able to measure the S11, the reflection, and the S21, the transmission, at the same time. It is also possible to transmit into the other end of the test object, measure in the reverse direction, and as an example, measure the isolation in the reverse direction of an amplifier. My VNWA equipment differs from the professional VNAs, and so far they have an internal switch, which can swap the TX port with the RX port for reverse measurement. My VNWA cannot do that, so when measuring S22 and S12 you must revert the test object by hand, it required a bit more mechanical handling, but provides the same result. However all four S parameters are measured with this setup. Besides, there is more to consider. What are we measuring and how do we measure correctly? The VNWA on its own is introducing measuring errors. The internal bridge is not perfect, and the transmitter and receiver have frequency dependencies, which we do not know exactly. We are not connecting the test object directly to the RX and TX port. We are having test cables in between, causing phase shift and attenuation, thus introducing further errors. And as seen on the slide, we notice the test object has short wires. And the test jig has PCB tracks, also introducing measuring errors. By using calibration standards, it is possible to calibrate the VNWA, so at least at the SMA connector, or whatever connector is sitting at the end of the test cables. All errors are removed during a calibration procedure, except for the PCB tracks on the test adapter shown. Actually we would like to measure the S parameters directly at the wire terminals of the test object, but the calibration is only correct at the connectors at the end of the test cables. But there is still a PCB track to consider, so what to do with that wire segment? But first we must see how to remove all errors in the VNWA itself and the influence from the test cables, so we at least can measure correct at the end of the test cables. That can as said, be performed by a calibration procedure. For a calibration we must first know the characteristics of our calibration standards. As calibration standards we are using a 50 ohm load standard, a short circuit standard, and a through adapter, which besides used for transmission calibration, also act as an open calibration standard. As why purchase an open standard, when a through adapter is equally fit for the job. Kurt Polson has done the hard work to derive the characteristics of the shown calibration standards, and has provided access to these data on his homepage, www.hamcom.tk slash vnwa, and you can then find the exact data for this specific set of calibration standards, Amphenol Connex from SDR Kids. The aim is to have our calibrations at the red line, being our calibration reference plane, such that a short circuit, whereas 1-1 is minus 1, is measured at the calibration reference plane. 
our calibration standards has physical lengths to consider, e.g. the open is at the end of the through adapter, the physical position of the short is somewhere to the right for the red line, and the load might not be perfect 50 ohm either. These lengths must be known to perform a calibration. Question from the audience regarding the load. The load is not perfect, and it is advisable to measure the DC resistance by a quality test equipment as a four-point measurement to determine the resistance. Further questions from the audience about the load. The position of the physical calibration plane for the load is often not of importance, as for the load there is no reflection, if 50 ohm. However it is important to have the resistance measured by a sensitive four-point measurement equipment and enter the found resistance in the calibration settings. There might also be a small contribution from a parasitic capacitance to compensate for and enter in the calibration settings. Here is show an example for a calibration setting in the VNWA software, where is entered the delay for the short, the open, and for the load, the measured resistance and maybe a small parallel capacitance. In addition can be entered the delay for through calibration standard, and also the loss, which is normally non-existing. You may e.g. use a 10 dB attenuator as the through calibration standard if required. Measuring an amplifier with gain might require such an attenuator to protect the RX port for too high levels. Then it might be wise to implement it up front. How are we arriving at these 111.1 picoseconds? The electrical length of the open calibration standard has been measured to be 53.2 picoseconds. In addition, it must be taken into account that by open calibration, the electrical field is extended slightly beyond the right side mechanical reference point into blue air, causing an additional small delay of about 2.3 picoseconds. Further must be observed that the reflected wave is passing twice the electrical length of the through adapter when used as open calibration standard. First forward through the adapter, then reflected backwards to our calibration plane, so we must enter twice the delay, as shown. The result is then 53.2 plus 2.34, multiplied by minus 2, which is rounded to minus 111.1 picosecond. Why minus, you may ask, and that is because the reflection is taking place to the right for the wanted calibration plane and then it must be pulled backwards against the TX port of the VNWA. So, after we have entered the calibration standard data, and saved calibration settings in a file with the descriptive name, we open the calibration menu, and after fitting the short calibration standard, we click on the short button, followed by fitting the open calibration standard, and a click on the open button followed by fitting the load calibration standard and perform a click on the load button, which then concludes reflection calibration. Next connect the TX and RX port via the through adapter and click on through calibration and subsequent on the through match calibration, the latter to compensate for the reflection at the RX port. The RX port is supposed to be 50 ohm, but that is not the case, so the mismatch errors can be mathematical calculated and errors corrected. There exists an old method to compensate for the crosstalk between RX and TX port, but that leads to new errors, so not recommended to use. It has only of usage, under special condition, and requires you know exactly what you are doing. The reflection calibration is required for measuring impedances, used for input reflection S11, and output reflections S22 measurements and when only measuring reflections, it is not needed to perform through and through match calibrations. When only measuring transmissions S21 and S12, it is likewise not necessary to perform reflection calibrations, but if the receiver input impedance is not perfect 50 ohm, 
then a reflection calibration recommended, as then further error correction can be done. Our system is, as demonstrated, calibrated to the SMA connector's reference plane. All errors behind this point are eliminated due to the calibration. What remains to be included in the calibration is the distance from the SMA connector to the component being tested, in this case a crystal filter. That is not right away possible, only if we have had special calibration standard to be fitted to the test adapter at where the filter is placed, we could have done so, but such calibration standards we do not have at hand. Instead, a method is available. If we assume that the PCB on the test adapter has a sensible 50 ohm transmission line from the connector to the point the filter is connected, at least we should design the test adapter along these assumption having a sensible 50 ohm transmission line with little loss at least far less than the filter and the transmission line will then only introduce a phase shift which is the same as a delay. This phase shift or delay we can measure by introducing a short at the measurement point at the filter. We then measure how long it takes to travel from the reference plane to the short and introduce half the delay in the port 1 extension. Now we have moved the measurement from the measurement plane to where the measurement is desired and where the VNWA is calibrated. We also measure the delay in the reverse direction, which is a bit larger due to a longer 50 ohm transmission line on the output side, and introduce the delay into a port 2 extension. We have then moved the measurement plane for both sides to the point of interest for measurements, the VNWA calibration plane. Question form the audience. How do we create this type of short? Simply by a short piece of wire. Is that short wire an additional 3 NH or so? Yes, but at 10 MHz you can do it without worries. I have done it at 1 GHz, using a short copper clad, or by my tweezer across the wires of the filter. The delay could also have been measured as an open, by removing the filter, but not so accurate, as we much take into account the unknown contribution to the delay, from the field created. Next, I will demonstrate to you what happens, if you do not know the parameters for the calibration standards or has entered wrong data that is possible to simulate in the VNWA software. In the latest versions there is a field in the calibration settings where you can enter an expression for simulation of an measurement. In this case we have entered a mathematical definition of an complex reflection factor. The W is omega 2 times phi time frequency and the EXP expression declares it as being exponential, so the expression is E exponent minus J multiplied by omega multiplied by 1800 exponent minus 12, where the latter factor correspond to 1800 picoseconds delay. The magnitude is 1, that means everything reflected as function of frequency embedded in omega. If we enter the frequency as 0, then the expression will be E exponent 0, which is 1, and we can conclude it is a 1800 picoseconds long, open 50 ohm transmission line. The higher the frequency, the more we move clockwise in the Smith chart, starting at extreme right, at the open point for the frequency 0, passing through the extreme left, being a short, at a certain frequency and then further on along the circumference of the Smith chart. Pending our frequency sweep range, we may turn several times, and pass more than once around the circumference. If you, after a calibration, measure such a device, a long open low loss 50 ohm transmission line, and the correct calibration data has been entered for your calibration standards, then you will see such a measurement is shown. You will see the delay being constant across the entire frequency range and see the delay measured as 800 picoseconds as previously entered. The S11 measured to be 1 as everything reflected. Next I will calibrate the VNWA with my physical calibration standards. Having delays for both short and open, but use a calibration setting as they were ideal calibration standards without any delay 
and also assume the load to be perfect 50 ohm, despite it is not, then we will see what magnitude of errors that leads to. Then we will observe a trace which shown a different result. First of all, the S11 trace runs outside the Smith chart circumference. It look like a circle, but the radius is no longer one all over the frequency range. Secondly, the delay in S11 traces are wobbling, and in particular the S11 having an error at high frequencies in the region of 0.4 decibel. The delay is thirdly also an error as the delay of calibration standards was not taken into account. More detail is to be found in the literature under port mismatch. Question from the audience. How would the red trace run if the calibration was without any error in the calibration settings? Answer. That is easy to explain. As everything is reflected, then it must be a flat line, as S11 is 0 decibel and the delay exactly 1800 picoseconds, being the length of my cable, I expected to see two flat line, but got instead the wobbling plots, and frequency dependent results. This behavior is called port mismatch. It has actually nothing to do with actual port mismatch, but is merely some calculation errors in the software, as invalid calibration data used, during the error correction, of the actual measurements question from the audience. What to understand if the trace is running outside the Smith chart circumference? Answer. As running along the circumference means that everything is reflected, then running outside means that more than everything is reflected. That is of course not possible for passive components, but dealing with amplifiers, which has negative differential resistances, then it can happen. If you see a trace outside the Smith chart, when measuring passive elements, such as filters and components, then you have made something wrong. Next topic is application examples. On the picture is shown a possible application for 2V and WAs. You have probably noticed we are arranging workshops for those signing up. And during the preparation, we have made a small test board, as shown. The workshop is primarily for newcomers to the VNWA, and as we are not going into the gigahertz range, but focus on the short wave range, then a range of interesting experiments is possible, and can be made with such a test board. It is neither required to use an expensive calibration kit, so a short wire can be used as short and ordinary leaded components are okay. Else, these days, the so-called chicken feet ICs are more no. Another short wire is used for through calibration. The test board is available in the workshops for those attending. For the reflection calibration, we need a load and the random selected resistor shown marked 47 ohm, can be measured, without using an ohmmeter. But by the VNWA, even without owing a calibration kit, or without reflection calibration, we can measure the resistance value, after a transmission measurement, where the resistor is inserted between the TX and RX port, and we are measuring how much power is transmitted from TX to RX port. We are thus forming a voltage divider between the unknown resistor and the 50 ohm input resistance of the RX port. Ideally, we should have a resistor of 50 ohm as load, but even 47 ohm, about 5% lower, is okay. And the power in the resistor is half the transmitted power, and the other half delivered to the RX port, being 50 ohm. The 47 ohm should provide an attenuation of 3.4 decibel. However, we need to establish a reference for measurement of the 3.4 decibel attenuation, which means we need to calibrate the 0 decibel reference line. A short wire, which is not causing any loss, connects the TX and RX port on the test board, followed by a through calibration. Then the wire removed and the test resistor inserted instead, followed by a S21 measurement.
The result is a fairly flat transmission trace, measured from 0.03 to 60 MHz, with about 3.33 dB negative amplification, or 3.33 dB attenuation, which is a bit less than the expected 3.4 dB, which means the resistance is a bit less than 47 ohm. Now how to find the resistance value? It is done by the VNWA software, through a mathematical calculation, on the measured S21 data. In the expression field, in a custom trace, is typed the formula T2S, in bracket, S21. The T2S function, I have included in the software, so you need not to perform any further calculation, but just utilize the conversion from S21 to the fictive S11 trace and display it as real and imaginary impedance. The expression T2S is a short name for the function transmission to reflection of S21. The resistance is 46.6 ohm at 30 megahertz and 46.58 ohm at 10 megahertz and a fairly flat trace seen. Observing the imaginary part, it is pretty small, being 0.16 ohm at 30 MHz, and positive, which indicates it is inductive. In the VNWA software it is called the custom trace, used for entering this expression, and many other and more complex usages. Next step is to enter the parameters, for the calibration standards, where the load resistance just measured, and as show on the slide as 46.6 ohm. The imaginary impedance at 10 MHz only 0.01 ohm and just disregarded, although some negative contribution should have been entered in the parallel C box. The open delay and short delay entered as ideal 0 picosecond, as we do not know better. Likewise the through delay set to 0 picosecond, and as no loose, the transmission factor set to 1. The few millimeter long through calibration standard is so short compared to the wavelength as regarded nidgerable. Now we are ready for a reflection and transmission calibration. First insert the short circuit and click on short. Next nothing inserted and click on open. Followed by fitting the 46.6 ohm load and click on load and reflection is calibrated. Subsequently, I can insert any component and measure the impedance. As an example a leaded 1 nanofarad capacitor, and we can see if it is of 1 nanofarad capacitance. Shown is a S11 measurement, and the trace is closely following the circumference of the Smith chart, as all energy reflected, and which is good for a capacitor, indication it has low loss. It has then a pretty high Q value. However I cannot directly, in the Smith chart, see its capacitance, but I can enable a trace for the parallel capacitance, and also for the real impedance enable a trace. At 10 MHz the capacitance is 1027 picofarad, and by 30 MHz it has 1474 pf capacitance. Nearby 30 MHz is happening some dramatic changes to the capacitance. The capacitance has a peak, and higher in frequency it is even negative. This is caused as the capacitor's leads, being inductive, is resonating with the capacitance, forming a series resonance circuit. Above the resonance frequency, the capacitor is even acting as a coil. Real part of the impedance is low, and representing the losses. The capacitor is mainly pure imaginary, then the losses in the capacitor is called ESR efficient series resistance. And 0.02 ohm at 10 MHz and 0.11 ohm at 30 MHz, this implies it is a good quality capacitor. I have some old MP0 capacitor, which runs well within the Smith chart, and I wonder how I in the past could get anything to work with these capacitors. I have tried to understand the behavior of the capacitor by creating a model of the capacitor in a custom trace. The series resonance circuit consists of the capacitor measured at a low frequency to 0.984 nanofarad. 
and the coil found to be 9.3 nanohenry, followed by the resistance 0.22 ohm, measured at a high frequency near resonance. The resistance is not constant across the frequency span, but value selected to simulate the resonance. The expression in the custom traces, the sum of three impedances. First the capacitance, 1 divided by j omega 0.984 exponent minus 9. Then the coil, plus j omega 9.4 exponent minus 9. And finally the resistor 0.22. The sum is then exposed to the function Z2S, which is converting impedance to S reflection parameters. The results is seen to fit nicely. The measurement is the brown trace, and the pink trace is the simulation. The match is quite accurate, although done by cut and try. The Smith chart traces are very identical. Conclusion is that the model is a quite accurate representation of the real world. Until now, we have seen measurement of one-port devices. And to demonstrate two-port measurements, I have found a very old coil-based bandpass filter with 11 kHz center frequency, and demonstrate that, besides measurements in the microwave region, it is also possible at very low frequency and at DC. The filter has input, ground and output connectors, and we will measure its response. When measuring on low frequencies with the VNWA, it is necessary to perform some few changes, and reduce the sampling rate. To prevent the 11 kHz signal, to pass into the frequency range of the analog digital converter. By reducing the sample rate to 300 Hz, then the Nyquist limit is 150 Hz and all frequencies above 150 Hz will be attenuated in the analog to digital converters input low pass filter. Thus we have ensured that the 11 kHz signal is not entering into the AD converter. One more detail is that when the sampling rate is reduced, the AF bandwidth is also reduced automatic. It must not be lower than 16 Hz, as the USB audio decoder does not respond to any frequency below 16 Hz. Thus the shown 76 Hz is a good choice. If these precaution is taken into account, then measurements at low frequencies not a problem, and with proper settings measurements down to 100 Hz is possible. From a technical point of view, the procedure is as before. Mount the short, click on short, then nothing connected, and click on open followed by fitting the 46.6 ohm resistor, followed by a click on load, and the reflection calibration performed. Additional we need to calibrate the transmission, and mount the through wire, followed by a click on through calibration, and then further a click on through match. Another importance notice is, that such narrow band filter measurement need a fairly slow sweep rate. The span is from 10 to 12 kilohertz, and if the sweep rate is 0.3 seconds, it is seen on the red trace that the filter is ringing. First when the sweep rate is reduced to 5 seconds as shown, the filter response is stabilized. At further slower sweep, it shall provide same response. You just have to observe that when reducing the sweep speed, the ringing get lesser and less. When stable condition reached, you have found the correct setting, which is quite simple to find by trial. So by sweeping slowly at 5 seconds per sweep, we will measure not only transmission, but also all 4S parameters. We select Measure, S parameters and 2 port and select to memory. We can even measure a 3 port device, but this time we are measuring a 2 port device. Subsequently, we are invited to connect the test object and measure from port 1 to port 2. It is important to note the port numbers on the filter. The window is also indicating clearly where the transmission comes from and the arrow also indicates the measurement direction. Click on the button and the measurement is performed in forward direction. Then, when forward measurements are done, the window changes for measurement in reverse direction, but prior to start the measurement, the filter must be reversed, 
for measurements from port 2 to port 1, of the filter. The filter connection is reversed, and not by reverting the test board, as the calibration is done only for the forward direction of the test board, so the wires to the filter is swapped between TX and RX. Click finally on the button, and the reverse direction is measured. Please help yourself by numbering the filter on both sides. It is easy to forget what was done, and to repeat a measurement later on, one requires good documentation. Once I measured a 5-port device, and apart from all the hard work of moving connector and cables, it is very easy to get lost. If using a test set, which automatic can swap input and output, these measurements is done much quicker. We have now the 4S parameters display for the filter. By the S21 and S12, forward and reverse transmissions. In addition to the S11 and S22, input and output reflections. Presented in the Smith chart, we observe the forward and reverse transmissions are identical, as they always are for a passive device, as long as it is not a circulator we measure. It is also a different story for amplifiers. If the forward and reverse transmissions are not identical for a passive device, then something is wrong. Besides the fairly nice filter slope, it has some 10 decibel strong ripple in the past band, and that is because the VNWA is with 50 ohm impedance at the TX and RX ports, and due to the filter is designed for other input and output impedances than 50 ohm to function properly. We can now initiate a task to find out what the optimum conditions are for a perfect function. My VNWA software offers a possibility in the form of a filter match function, where the source and load impedances can be modified, including imaginary elements, and by changing from 50 ohm to 610 ohm, on either side, the filter response is perfected. We can conclude it is an old telephone filter, as it prefers to see 600 ohm impedances, at input and output. Well. Is it correct what the software figured out? We will test that situation with a normal VNWA measurement. By adding in series with TX and RX ports, a 560 ohm resistor, which is a standard value, and together with the 50 ohm for the TX and RX port, it equals 610 ohm. The additional 560 ohm resistor can quickly be added to the test board. And when I superimpose the two curves, the filter responses are identical. The additional 560 ohm resistors create attenuation. So I had to shift the blue trace by 21.8 eb. Whether this shift is correct can be calculated by the VNWA software, as it also contains a complex mathematical calculator and all the mathematical functions which can be used in the custom traces, can also be executed in the complex calculator. Then the impedance of 2 times 560 ohm is converter with the function Z2S, impedance to reflection S parameters, and subsequently converted from reflection to transmission by the function S2T, and presented with the unit decibel. The result is seen to be minus 21.7 decibel, which matches the minus 21.8 decibel measured. I would like to demonstrate the simulation program QUCS, quite universal circuit simulator, which has the great advantage of being free of charge. It is an excellent circuit simulator and can be downloaded from http colon slash slash qcs.sourceforge.net and as said free of charge with no limitations, and easy to operate. I have worked with AppLack, as they have a free student version, with limitations, but that is not so easy to operate. QUCS has graphical and exporting capabilities, which needs improvements, but a new version just released, now apparently with better facilities on import and export, of touchstone files. So what do we do? We are saving our S parameter of measurements, made with the VNWA, or any other VNA, 
as touchstone files, and in the QUCS we import it into a so-called data block. All the filter data as S11, S22, S12 and S12 for the filter is stored in the data block and scene is also the file name for the touchstone file filter 11 kilohertz bpf.s2p extensions for touchstone files are s1p for single port data s2p for two port s3p for three port and so on in the schematic we add the two 560 ohm resistors and add a signal source with source impedance 50 ohm on both side so we can simulate transmission in both forward and reverse direction. This schematic allows us to do a S parameter simulation and use 400 points with linear frequency span from 10 to 12 kilohertz. And on the next slide is shown what the result of the simulation is. It is not exactly a nice presentation as the frequency scale is on top of other elements and there is no dB indication on the vertical axes. All these details can be fixed in the program when you have properly learned to use it. The simulation can be exported to a touchstone file and imported into the VNWA software to compare with the measurements, which will be shown on the next slide. As you can see, there is a perfect match between the simulation and the measurements of the filter. The blue trace is the measurements with 24.48 dB attenuation in the center, and the green trace is the simulation, with minus 24.38 dB attenuation in the center. It is also possible for yourself to build a filter, and you can find superb and free of charge filter simulation programs where LC is a good choice. The name is originated from LC, meaning coil and capacitor. LC can be downloaded from http colon slash slash tonsoftware.com slash LC download .html, and with which you can design LC filters and watch the filter response. You can either purchase a license or use the student version limited to seven dipoles. A LC design can also be exported as a touchstone file and imported in the VNWA software. Another free software for design of crystal filters is called Dishel from DJ6EV to download from http colon slash slash www.bartelsos.de slash dk7jv.php and then find the links to the program. The program is, as said, for design and analyzing of crystal filters, but does not take into account any losses in the crystals. However, these are normally very small, so acceptable results obtained. There is also facilities for at least an export of S21 in the form of a touchstone file for import in other programs, such as VNWA software or QUCS, for further simulation. From AADE, you can download another program for design of both ordinary filter as well as crystal filters. The download link is http colon slash slash aade dot com slash filter three two slash download dot htm. When designing crystal filters, this program has the limitation that it does not include the parallel capacitor for the crystals. So the designer creating analyzes of the filter with the slightly narrower bandwidth. However, the simulation cannot be exported by the program. Apart from that limitation, it is an excellent program, and easy to use. Now follows an example, for a band pass filter, designed with LC. It is a three-pole Butterworth filter, where the entries in the program are, center frequency and bandwidth, and then it delivers the schematic right away. As you see, the values for the components are not standard values and the response looks very fine, based on the design done by LC. In LC you can edit the values, and then study how the response then looks like. You can even enter Q values for the coils, and capacitor losses, as seen the filter response still looks pretty good after selecting standard values. We see a small attenuation in the band pass region, 
Due to the finite losses in the coils, and when you click on the right button, then the design is exported as a touchstone file. I have built the filter on the test board with components as follow. At the input L and C in parallel, between input and output the L and C in series, and at the output L and C in parallel. This coil is specified to have parallel resonance at 50 MHz, and above 50 MHz it is capacitive, and as sitting in series. Between TX and RX, it blocks for the transmission. Just like for the 11 kHz filter, the 4S parameters measured, and compared with the exported simulation from LC, the S21 responses seems quite identical. The test board has of course parasitic capacitances, and inductance is disturbing, and the simulation was done with ideal components. A fixed inductor has often 10% tolerance, and likewise for capacitors some tolerances. What not at all is correct, is the dip in the blue trace, for the measured S21. When tracing this phenomena, it is found to be due to the parallel resonance of the serial coil. Thus the dip created in the blue trace. Then follows an example with a crystal, measured in transmission mode. When building crystal filters, it is wise first to measure the crystals. Crystal is often quite cheap to purchase, and is acquired in quantities, so you can sort and select. A vector network analyzer is a perfect tool for such measurements and selections. In my VNWA software I have implemented a special tool where you insert one crystal after the other and click on a button and then a list of all the crystals and their parameters is listed for all the measured crystals. The list can even be saved in an Excel file. As an example, the first crystal has a series resonance frequency of 12.995915 MHz, the second of 12.995927 MHz, and so on. Listed are the series resonance, the Q, the series inductance, the series capacitance, the series resistance, and finally the parallel capacitance and frequency. All shown in the displayed equivalent schematic for a crystal. All these data are automatic extracted by the software. These data is used in the program for crystal filter design, and I have entered the average crystal parameters in the AADE design software. However, the entered parallel capacitance is not being used in the calculation and optimization of the filter design. Below we see the entered data being used for the simulation being 0 0.023499 Henry, which corresponds to the 23.499 millihenry. Then 6.38 minus 15 farad, which corresponds to the 0 0.0638 picofarad, the Q value also found, and finally the holder capacitance named C0 being 2.5 picofarad. Next step is to decide the topology of the filter, and in particular the bandwidth. And the software spit out the circuit diagram. The series and shunt capacitances are 66 picofarad. The design is a so-called minimum loss design, and the filter does of course like to see a source and load impedance different from 50 ohm to optimize its performance. In this case 168 ohm. A standard capacitance of 68 picofarad used. As quite close to 66 picofarad. I have the circuit simulated in QUCS. Using 68 picofarad. And further used the S11V and WA measurements. Stored as a S1P touchstone file of a single crystal. For all the three data blocks. The source and load impedance is 50 ohm. I have also built the filter on the test board with three crystals, two series and two shunt capacitances, but without any attempt to correct the source and load impedance. Thus a condition established for a measurement being identical to the QUCS simulation. Then I measured the filter with the VNWA and compared the measurement with the QUCS simulation.
They look pretty identical, and as always there are not a perfect match between theory and experienced results. That it quite often experienced, when building a bird's nest in free space, without proper grounding. Once again the matching tool, of the VNWA software, used to adjust the source and load impedance to 168 ohm, for both the QUCS simulation, and the measurement, and as seen the result is quite perfect. To conclude, we have measured components, designed filters, simulated filters and measured the built filters, to see how they fit to the simulation and designs. Then I have the pleasure to wish you good luck with the workshop. So, der ist schon alt, aber immer noch gut.